themselves. Um, we're very fortunate to have the folks from USA Hockey uh, and we ended up with Bree today to join us and speak to our parents. Um, they, they flew in just today. Um, they just got here and they've been running around and they're here to, to, to speak with you guys at the end of the night here. We appreciate you staying with us uh, for, so, for so long tonight as well. Um, the first gentleman to my right here is Scott Pollock. He's a regional manager for the American Development Model with USA Hockey. He was a head coach at Bowling Green University, an assistant coach at Boston College where they won a national championship. He's in the Illinois Hockey Hall of Fame. He was the coach uh, for many U.S. select teams, national teams as well. Played for the U.S. national junior team uh, and for Bowling Green where he is the uh, all-time leading points for a defenseman and signed professionally with the St. Louis Blues. We could give a round of applause for Scott Paul. Our IT specialist in the middle here, Ken Martell, is the technical director of the American Development Model. He earned the USOC Doc Councilman Award for efforts using science to advance sports. He's on the, he was on the, served on the U.S. national team development staff. He's been on the bench for many U.S. national teams, the national junior team, the women's national team. Also coached at Air Force and Michigan Tech, and was a four-year letter winner and national, won a national title, title as a player at least at Superior State. Please give a round of applause for Ken Martin. And on the far right, Kevin McLaughlin, the Senior Director for Hockey Development for USA Hockey. Kevin oversees the Youth and High School National Championships. He oversees all national player development camps, the Hockey Director Training and Certification Program in ARS that uh, all of our program directors have actually attended. Uh, also the U17 and U18 US Select Teams. He's a member of the International Ice Hockey Federation Development Committee. That is the national governing body for ice hockey for the world. Uh, Kevin travels the world and works with staff from, from all different countries on hockey and uh, is, again, very fortunate for us to have him with us today. And he's actually going to, if you could give a round of applause for Kevin. Great, thank you, Ben. And uh, thanks all to all of you guys, too, for, for being here and grinding this out a little bit. I understand that uh, the season for most of you actually starts tomorrow. Um, but I, I, we're really, really excited to be here and have this opportunity because I don't know if you, you probably are too close to it to realize you guys are in a very, very special situation, very special, uh, have a special opportunity with your kids and the program that they're part of. Uh, the Wildcats have been a, a USA Hockey model club for the last few years. And what that means is that um, they commit to uh, to meet minimum of 70 requirements from uh, little kid hockey uh, all the way through 14U hockey. So uh, there, it's not easy. We, we have a saying that um, ADM model club is, is simple, not easy. And uh, the leadership uh, from Ben and his staff is uh, it, it's it's very impressive. It's not just impressive. It's it's really outstanding and and uh, recognized not just by USA Hockey, which is the the uh, governing body for ice hockey, from uh, the Olympic team all the way down to little kid hockey and, and grow the game component, uh, but also recognized by the National Hockey League, recognized by the U.S. Olympic Committee, uh, recognized by uh, NCAA hockey and uh, the ice hockey coaches within the NCAA. So. Uh, don't ever underestimate the opportunity that you have and, and the experience that your children are receiving being part of this because I can tell you this, that these guys work their tails off uh, to put the individual player first and foremost uh, and development and experience is, uh, is the most important thing in their mind. I know when they call us or when they attend any of our programs, uh, you know, they're, they're fully engaged and they, uh, they ask a lot of questions, and I know where their heart and, and, uh, and mind is at as they try to build the best program that they possibly can. They all have very, very strong hockey backgrounds. Ben said that we're humble, but I can tell you that these guys are extremely humble as well. Um, yes, these guys have extreme uh, playing experience, but the guys that are running your, club, your children's club um, have an unbelievable playing experience and background as well. 
and obviously they're dedicated to coaching kids. And we, you know what, we, we uh, there's a delicate balance here when, when we go and give presentations because part of us wants to uh, to talk about you know the high performance stuff and the elite stuff and the high end stuff that uh, I don't know everybody seems to to look at like the shiny penny. But quite honestly, we all have kids. We all have kids that have played youth hockey. We coach little kid youth hockey. I was a hockey director. Our passion is little kid hockey. That's what we care about. We don't, and it's not just developing elite players or Olympians. We want people to love the sport of ice hockey. I was born in Houston, Texas. Ken Martell was born in Los Angeles. Uh, not really hockey hotbeds. We love the game. My dad was a professional baseball player. Um, I wanted to be a hockey player. I started skating when I was three. It was different than anything else. It's a unique deal. I truly believe it's the best sport in the world. And when people get it, it's, it's a disease. We get it. It's a passion. And we love it. And whether we play beer league hockey, whether we play house league hockey on the red team, or whether we just play stick and puck hockey on, on the weekend when there's open ice, it's the best sport that there is. And yes, those skateboard parks are cool. Pond hockey, pickup hockey, ice hockey is way better. So with that, uh, I don't want to mislead anybody that that uh, we're just here to you know put your kids in this incubator program and they'll be on the Olympic team in 18 years from now. That ain't, that ain't the plan. Uh, what we're what we're really excited about is to talk to you about USA Hockey Youth Hockey, and uh, we're going to go through kind of the the tell you what the background is. We're going to uh, Ken and, and Scott are going to give you uh, some specific information on age appropriateness, age specific programming, um, why that's a win, win, win. It's a win for your kid. It's a win for the program. It's a win for the rink and the rink business. It's a it's a win for player development or it's a win for growth of the sport across the country. Um, as you guys know, probably talking to your neighbors across the street or next door, to left and right. You know, some of us, when I was in Houston as a kid, people used to literally stop their car and ask, what's those hockey poles, boy? They didn't know. They didn't know what hockey was. It wasn't on TV. It was new. It was different. And I'm sure there's still some of that in Southern California. I mean, with the success of and the growth of hockey, whether it be minor pro hockey or youth hockey uh, or even pro hockey up and down the coast, I know it's uh, it's becoming more popular with it on NHL Network and you know, highlights on Sports Center now and stuff. You never used to have that, but it's a little bit more familiar, but it's still not football, baseball, basketball, or even lacrosse in some areas, or even swimming or water polo and all those other sports that are out there. But we're on the we're on the cop and we're on the make and uh, is our Canadian friend still here? Where are you from? You from Canada, right? I wasn't sure. Right? Absolutely. We're on the come, baby. We're on the come. We know. And uh, it's all my friends in Hockey Canada. Look up. <laughs> so tonight, what we're going to do is we're, we're going to talk about this uh, American development model. Uh, we truly believe is is a world leading youth sports program, and it's uh, the cool thing is it's not just a hockey program. And for those of you that do have uh, educational background. Um, it, it's not much different than what elementary phys ed was that a lot of us had in school. It's not, it's not much different than, uh, than, than what you'll recognize as far as that. It's age appropriate, age specific. That's really all it is. It's a marathon, it's not a sprint. You can't speed farm. That's all it is. We want to get more kids into the game and we want to retain those kids and so they just love the game. And, and, and we're not in a, any hurry, we're not, we're, in fact, if we're doing anything, we're trying to slow things down and, and enjoy the ride. Enjoy the ride, wherever your kid might fit into this, into this Ferris wheel or this, this highway. And the cool thing is, is uh, we've been recognized by multiple federations around the world. We've been recognized by uh, National Hockey League, U.S. Olympic Committee, um, and other sports are starting to adopt it. And that's really, really cool for us. Um, because we're promoting multiple sports and other, other sports look at us like, you guys are crazy. You're telling your hockey members that they should go play lacrosse, that they should go swim, that they should go ski, that they should do other things, that they should play soccer. And we're like, yeah, because that's what sports science tells you. Build a better athlete. And if the kid has a passion to be a hockey player in the long term, then they'll be a better hockey player long term. And maybe we're just a little bit confident or overconfident that we think kids will gravitate to our sport because it's fun, you know? If we do it right, if we program it right, if we make it fun, 
if we disguise the programming and the, and the player development with fun, and we just wrap it in fun, then they're going to stick to our sport, and they're going to play it, and the athletes will percolate to the top, and we'll have more good elite players. We've got 300 million people in our country. We should be pretty good, right? We should be pretty good. It's just like the Olympics. Everybody gets all jazzed up. We have more, more medals than other countries. we got more people than most countries. So it's awesome that we've got more medals than France, more medals than Croatia, more medals than Serbia. Well, you know, shouldn't we? we got more people. So anyway, we're going we're gonna to do a better job with ice hockey. We're going to make it more fun. A um, couple of the things is, is like we were talking about the Wildcats and what they do is they are doing what's right for, uh, for uh, young people, as Tom said. Um, and don't be fooled by ego, glitz, and glamour. Tom, I love that. Because as you guys go through this um, youth sport deal, and especially if you fall in love with hockey, uh, there are going to be a lot of things that pull you in different ways. And if your kid is a pretty good player, you're going to be pulled in different ways for a multitude of reasons. But don't ever forget why your kid, or where they got good. I, I laugh when I get a phone call from people in Arizona whose kid might be a top five kid in the country or something like that, or 15 or 16 or even 13 or 14. And they say, we're thinking about moving to Michigan. Well, why would you move from the club where they helped you become one of the best players to where you're being recruited? Why not stay there and keep doing what you're doing because it's obviously working. That's why you're being recruited by these other people. In time, you know, as you start to get older in high school or maybe looking at colleges or junior programs, maybe then it's time, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Stay where you are. Work the plan. It's a marathon, not a, not a spread. If I can if leave you guys with one thing tonight, enjoy the ride. Enjoy being six-year-old. Enjoy being seven. Enjoy being eight. And enjoy 365 days of that. Because you never get to turn the clock back. And every single parent of a 15-year-old, a 17-year-old, a 20-year-old wishes they could be an eight-year-old hockey player again. And wishes they could be a 10-year-old hockey player again and play for fun and enjoy that, right? Enjoy that. Um, do your research, uh, know the truth, make informed decisions. Tom, great point. Uh, we, I have a saying, I'm a little bit sarcastic sometimes, but I say, do you think or do you know? Because there's a whole lot of naive people around the ice rink that are telling you what you should do but do you think or do you know? And I can tell you that the Wildcats, being one of 21 model clubs that we have out of 2,500 clubs around the country, they know. They've done their research, they've done their homework, and the cool thing about them is they actually have some experience under their belt ahead of most other model clubs, ahead of most 2,500 clubs around the country. They know. They've been doing it. They've learned from other clubs around the country that have all share stories and share experiences. So just appreciate, appreciate what their knowledge and, uh, and experience brings to your child. And uh, last but not least that I'll leave you is, Tom talked about uh, uh, scholarship money. There's, so while he was talking about it, I Googled it back there because I, I knew I'd seen this before, but there's nine times more money available in academic scholarships than there is athletic scholarships. I can tell you, I just got back from Czech Republic with our under-18 team, and the best players, it's, it's really funny, but the best players have the best grades. It's really interesting. So those kids, they're getting academic money or, or athletic money, and I think it's a personality trait, it's a discipline trait, it's usually a reflection on the family of what kind of discipline, and, what, and success in that classroom lends itself to success on the athletic field. So. Um, I thought it was interesting. There's $9.5 billion of academic scholarship money versus $1 billion. 17% of all students receive academic money. Only 1% receives athletic money. So just keep that in mind. I don't want to, it's a delicate balance too. We don't want to put anybody's dreams out of being a hockey player, being a league player, being a college scholarship player, or being an NHLer. We want every kid, honestly, we want every kid to dream of that. But it has to be the kid's dream. As parents, we have to understand the bigger picture and the, and the scope of the world and what, what is really out there for us. So uh, with that, I will, uh, I'll turn it over to, to Ken Martell, our technical director uh, of the American Development Model, and Scott Pollock.
Thanks, Kevin. So, uh, I am from Southern California. Born and raised, played all my youth hockey here. Um, you know, it, it was a great experience, but the opportunities now, compared to 30 years ago, it, it's night and day. So, I'm really excited that I get to come back home uh, to my home state and see the growth of hockey, see the enthusiasm, see all the opportunities that kids have. And Ke so Kevin talked about our passion. Um, it, it really is little kid hockey. It's, it's, it's for the average kid. We want lifelong hockey players. Because uh, that's what I am. I grew up here, had fun playing, and ended up with a job in the sport. Like, this is, to me, uh, I, I'm living a dream. I'm not playing, but I'm still living the dream. Now, you'll notice at the bottom of the slides, it says play, love, and excel. We want to get our kids into the sport, we want them to play, we want them to fall in love with it. And then if they do, then you know what? The ones that truly have a passion and, and really want to extend themselves, maybe they'll, at that point, push towards excel. But you got to play and you got to love it first. Because we know that at the end of the day, if you don't have that passion, then you're really not going to put the time in to be good at it. You know, an elite player down the road. But we can all end up in the beer and pizza league where I play on, you know, occasionally on Tuesdays with my friends. It's fun. We have a lifelong sport. You can play for We have a 70 year old national championship. Try that with American football. <laughs> right? We all got to go to work the next day. So, really, really good stuff. And the other thing over here is that little logo. It, it says, it's USA Hockey and the NHL, proud partners in hockey. Well, the National Hockey League and USA Hockey have two mutual long-term goals. One is to have more American kids play, and they'd really like to see more American kids play the sport really well. You know, nothing makes them happier than, for example, we've now had Southern California kids, born and raised, that have played for the Kings, played for the Ducks, played for the Sharks. That's really cool. That wasn't happening when I grew up. So, there's opportunities. California is really not looked at in the real hockey world anymore as this far off land. It's, it's really part of the landscape. It's, it's becoming much more of a traditional sport here than anywhere else in terms of the numbers of kids that we have playing. So, really good stuff. And we'll talk a little bit about player development because that's what our American development model is about. Um, now, the guys that coach the Kings and the Ducks and the Sharks, they may at some point, in a lot of respects, have an easier job coaching than the Wildcat staff does here. Because those are fully formed adults. They're known commodities, you know, adult to adult conversations. That's easy. With your kids, geez, every time you turn around, every time you think you know them, and you see this as parents, you think you know them, they've changed again. And they're growing and changing in all these different areas at different rates. And it's not this nice, smooth, linear path. It's forward, backwards, all over the place. And I remember when my daughter, was; she was absolutely fantastic. And then one day at about 12, 13, it was like, who the heck are you and what you do with my child? And she was kind of mean and nasty for a few years. And now she's back to being a pretty good kid. But they, they go through different phases. I got one that's 22 and one that's 25. So, as Kevin said, uh, cherish the time you have with them going through this process because, it, you know, at some point, I kind of wish, you know, it would be really cool to be going through this all again, but that's life. So, growth and development in our kids. Average growth rate pattern for, for girls, average growth rate pattern for boys. Chronological age right here. And what we see is for the average kid, Someplace at around you know 12, 13 as, as a boy, they hit that adolescent growth spurt. Things get out of whack on them. Girls a little bit younger, but this can be plus or minus two years for kids. Doesn't know that's the average. Some kids are early, some kids are late, and all kinds of change going on. Now we know that through human growth and development that there are certain times where kids are a little more receptive to acquiring certain capacities, whether that's mentally, whether that's um, uh, physically. And think about this in terms of, of, of learning a new language. You as adults, if you're going to try and learn a new foreign language, well, it takes an awful lot of effort 
for us to get a little bit out of it. Whereas if you expose the child at the very right time for learning language, they absorb and pick it up really, really quickly. So there's a little of that going on. Now, as human beings, we're, we're very adaptable, so we can always learn new things. You certainly can. But a lot more time and effort. So what we want to do with our program is really sequence what we're giving the kids at, at points that they're most receptive to acquiring certain things. And for, for our kids before they hit that growth rate, it's really skills, sports skills. And that's the one we sort of miss out on in ice hockey. You know, the, the, the teams that are traveling around playing a 1,000 games and missing out on some practice time at your local rink it is where we kind of lose out. And then it shakes out later on after, uh, after adolescence back over here, 15, 16, 17, 18. That's when you start to figure out things about the kids. So not just physically, but cognitively as well. And I know this slide's a little busy and it's hard to read in the back, but age is across here. Some different cognitive capacities, attention, memory, reasoning, exec executive functions, uh, um, general resources. All you really need to look at this and go, geez, prior to the age of 10, there's not a lot going on, <laughs> right? So what we know is it's really difficult now for us to go and try and teach the left wing lock four check to a bunch of eight and nine year olds. They're just not ready for that kind of thinking at this particular point. So we try and do things on the ice that they're a little bit more receptive to. Working on you know, their technical skills, working on some one-on-one -on -one battles, let them play a little bit. It, there's, there's things, we'll get to all that stuff in time, and hopefully, because we know what the Wildcats are doing, they're trying to build a really good base of skills over here, so that later on, when they do have those cognitive capacities to, to learn the sport in greater detail, they'll be much, much better and, and more receptive to, to being able to play the sport. Because I see it in my local association where I was a high school coach for a few years, and I got tired of watching these kids come up that had played for you know, 10 years and you, you, you scratch your head because they can't catch a pass, they can't make a basic play, and you know, they love the sport, but you, you want to ask them, well, who's been stealing your money all these years, right? So that's it, it better sequencing of what we do. So how do you, anyone have teenagers yet? I mean, driving cars? What's your car insurance like? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, again, mine went through this, oops. Mine went through it as well. Um, so first day that they were eligible to get behind the wheel, did you let them go on the highway? <laughs> Absolutely not, weren't quite ready for it. Yet, they spent hours and hours and hours in the car with you watching you drive. Hey, how come they can't drive? Because you don't learn by watching, you don't learn motor skills by watching. It's very important to do. Repetition's very important, okay? That's why the, the practice setting that the Wildcats set up is really important because they're going to try and give lots of repetitions to your kids at basic basic skill development. So when you're learning to drive a car, you have to learn what the pressure's like on the pedal, you know, what the steering wheel is like. You try it, you try it, you make some mistakes, and you get back on. Same way you learn to ride a bike. I know that everybody in this room, if we were to go outside and throw you on a bike, you could still ride. Think of the permanence of riding a bike, right? Now, did your, did your parents, when you were growing up, hire a bicycle riding coach specialist? <laughs> no? No, didn't get that for you? Well, how did you learn? Practice. Yeah, got on the bike and tried to fail. Got on the bike again, tried to fail. Maybe got a little bit, fell off, failed. Got back, tried it again. Kind of started to figure it out. So, the Wildcats, in their practice setting. They're going to put them, the kids in some real life hockey decision making situations and somewhat let them figure out some things. Now, they're going to try and give them instruction because we know repetition and feedback are both very important for learning. But at the end of the day, they're going to try and give kids repetitions so that they can, can learn. And the only way they're going to learn is by doing it. Now, this is uh, one of our other regional managers, his son, Sammy. And you can't quite hear the audio, but he's saying, hey, Sammy, go ride the blue bike. So Sammy jumps on the blue bike, gives a little spin around the, the cul-de-sac there, comes back. Now, the bike's a little bit too small, right? Not, not appropriately sized equipment. 
Um, certainly not challenging. It's eh, not a good fit. Okay, Sam, ride the white bike. Little Sammy's going to jump on this bike. Probably a good bike for him because it's just a little bit beyond his capacity, but he can do it. Because you want to have success, but you want to be challenged. So, comes back, really quite, quite the, the appropriate fit for, for young Sam. Now Dad says, hey, uh, Sam, we go try the, the other bike. failure zone, right? So that's what we're looking to do. And as the kids get older, this is really important as well because we don't practice hockey to get good practice. We practice so hopefully we're better in the games. That's the goal. And the optimal word here is really transfer. So are we doing in practice what's going to best suit the kids to allow it to transfer to the real game? And as they get older and have acquired a, a skill set, it's very important that we put them into situations where practice more and more resembles the real game. So repetition without being repetitive. Because that's our sport. Nothing happens exactly the same way twice. It happens close, but not exactly. So there's this randomness and variability in what we do. So practice has to look like that. Because in our country, we have kids that can perform the skill, and they can actually perform a skill pretty well, but they can't do it at speed, under fatigue, under pressure, consistently in competitive situations. Well, if that's the issue, and the kids have, you know, might squirt peewee, they've acquired these types of skills, then it becomes really important that we actually put them in those situations in practice, make practice difficult, so that they have a chance then, when they come to the game, that the game's much easier. So, in terms of teaching our kids, there's three types of skills that we're going to work on when we're on the rink. Unfortunately, these are the easy ones, the motor skills, because everybody can see that. The real problem is, is these things, two-thirds of what we're working on in our sport, really difficult for us to watch and understand what's going on in their head. Now, the cognitive skills are hey, how to play one-on-one, -on -one, how to play stick-on-puck, how to attack two on one, okay? Some, some understanding in the game's basics. The perceptual skills, well, those are what make, say, a Pat Kane maybe the best player in the world right now. It's his ability to subtly judge that, hey, the guy's hips are turned just a little bit, I can take advantage. Or, puck's gone into the corner, I'm going to get it. A quick glance, and I've got some pattern recognition, I understand. When I get to the puck a couple seconds later, where my players are going to be. And both of these, really take a lot, well, all three take lots of time. I know as we pointed out, it's not a sprint, it's, it's a marathon. It just takes lots of time to be good at, at anything. So, mites, young kids, we put them in stations, we break things up. I mean, think about this in school, all right, in terms of repetition and feedback for your kids in school. Do you want your kids in a classroom that has 30 kids, one, one teacher teaching, or do you want your kids in a classroom where there's one teacher and maybe eight kids? Much better for learning, right? So we do the same thing in practice. We try and break it up into smaller groups. Uh, they don't certainly can't get around the rink well enough to, to use the whole surface at these ages. And this is a good structure for them at eight and under. Now after that, the coaches have to start to become a little bit more creative, whether it's using a sixth of the ice, a third of the ice, a half of the ice, three quarters, whatever it is, full ice, to teach whatever aspects of the game that need to be taught. Keeping in mind we want to give the kids lots of repetitions, we want to do it in groups or in, in, in smaller numbers so that they have a chance to learn better. That's it. Not rocket science. So here's an example, I know the video is kind of chugging along here, but Good practice at, at uh, the peewee level. Here's a little game going on. 
It's got a one to two work to rest ratio. In neutral zones, some random and variable passing. It's not two kids going down the ice passing back and forth where there's no real judgment going on. This is you got to make a decision. You got to read your teammates' stick and body position. You got to make think about where you're going to pass the puck. And even down here at the end, when they're doing some type of goalie drill, it, it's happening randomly so that the goaltenders aren't getting the same shot from the same place time after time after time after time. They have to actually move and make adjustments. And we know that that's a much better way of learning for permanence versus just over and over and over. So, now, all I want you to watch from this clip here is, is how many big boys are in one sixth of the ice surface? This is the Toronto Maple Leafs, so it's probably not a very good example to use. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, you know, I mean, it's facts. They won a Canadian team that made playoffs this year. Interesting. Look how many big kids are in one sixth of the ice. And if you actually step back and look at the real adult version of our sport, how much time is spent in that one-sixth of the ice? It's a pretty considerable chunk of time. Yeah, sure, there's some up and down, right? And we're going to do that with the kids, too, at different points. But we're still going to always keep coming back to a lot of that because that's a big part of the sport. You have to be able to play in small space and to travel. Now, but they don't get to play long at the end of the year because it's not about being an ice player. It's about winning your battle every time you out is. There's no space and there's no room and the ice gets worse as the year goes on. And so it's not about being pretty and it's not about open ice or who looks good in practice with no pressure on them. Who can make a play in a small area and win a battle? To me, that's the game. So, not about open ice, not about looking pretty in practice. Sometimes as coaches, we have this issue where we like things to look really organized and the lines are straight and it, it looks really good from the stands, but that's not our sport. Our sport's about winning a battle, making a play, and so putting kids into that situation over and over and over and over, they get a chance to figure some things out. Because at the ultimate end of the, the sport, you have to figure out as a player how to win your one-on-one -on -one confrontation. Offensively, defensively. Use your size, strength, speed, head, whatever it is, you have to figure out how to solve that problem. And the ones that can do it consistently have a chance. So, just so that you know that from a USA Hockey standpoint, we kind of practice a little bit of what we preach because the ADM was built based on uh, a lot of what we learned. And unfortunately, I was with our national team program in its early years. So, been with USA Hockey almost 20 years now. And I can tell you, we collected a bunch of high school kids and we made a lot of mistakes because we tried treating some high school age players like the college and professional players that we were used to dealing with as coaches. We weren't treating them the way they should have been treated at that age. And we figured some things out and got successful. So any guess on what those numbers are? And definitely not win loss with time. Okay, because that's not the focus there. So, 130 practices, 100 off ice sessions, 50 games. That's what we play with our best teenagers in the United States. And that, that 50 games, um, look, we tried playing the major junior schedule 20 years ago, and it, 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 that doesn't work. It, it, it's not good for kids in their development. And again, you get good at your local rank. It's not chasing things all over the country. It's, it's what happens day to day at your local rink. So we try and create the same situation. Bring kids to practice, you know, do a lot there locally, and then we, we play some games. But um, for that age, that's about the right number. And again, we made some mistakes. And I have to go back and apologize to a bunch of players that I had a long time ago about, hey, you know, I should have been better. We should have been better. But we learn and move on. So some of the current focus for our American development model and where we're going with all this and things that we'll be able to bring back to the Wildcats as we go. Um, 
you know, certainly I think they're doing a good job of trying to see your kids for where they're at, because that's not an easy skill. Again, they're not dealing with fully formed adults.
with some of the best kids in the, in the country. Learning to battle, learning to, to play in tight spaces. There's 40 plus kids on the rink. We do this with our national team. So we, we walk the walk at, with every level. So don't think that we're telling you to do something with your little kids that we're not doing with our big kids. And I apologize, my computer is getting old and slow. Kevin, you need to do computer. Got to sign off on that. Thank you. Should look familiar to a little bit of what, what you guys see um, with your teams. So we're excited. We've got a new goaltending program. Um, we really want to focus. We're going to try and get Phil out to visit your club at some point uh, in, in this year as well. He's our Phil O'Sara is our, our new national goaltending guy, um, and he's trying to develop some affiliate goaltending coordinators. So an affiliate for us in USA Hockey, California, the state organization is our affiliate. We're trying to get somebody here to work with the kids. And our goal is really to have your, your association have a goaltending guy. And then every one of your teams have some coach that's sort of assigned uh, as being the guy that's going to watch out for the goaltending. You know, because we, we certainly complain when we don't have good ones. And then in our sport, a lot of times it's always, hey, just go stop the puck. Well, that's not good enough for our, our goaltenders. So we've come up with a few different things that uh, – uh, we think are pretty good. Lots of new resources for those guys. Um, we've got this quick change goalie equipment. And our goaltending program, this is the goal. And I love that they've stuck this right out there. We have this goaltending group of goalie coaches across the country. This is it. Have Americans, 70% of the minutes played in the NCAA by 2023, 51% of the goalie minutes in the NHL by 2030. So, they're going to work pretty hard at that. And here is sort of the quick change gear. Uh, it's pads that go right over your shin pads for little kids. So any of your, your eight-year-olds want to test it out, they'll get a chance to, uh, you know, try the, try the pads, try the gloves on. And we're going to send six sets of that gear gratis uh, to uh, the Wildcats as one of our programs. So they'll have those around here. Uh, they're being manufactured now. They'll get here in uh, November. Anyway. The audio's working now. Is that just happening? Anyway, so. On and off really quick. So you get the idea. Um, so our program that we put in place about six, seven years ago, we're really excited because we're starting to get lots of notoriety. There was a big event, I'll have to back up. There's this uh, Aspen Institute, it's a sort of a think tank, but they've got this sport and society program. And Tom Ferry with ESPN, I don't know if you're familiar with Tom, he did Outside the Lines regularly for, for ESPN, he's a uh, sports writer. And he wrote a book called Game On, and it's about the, the problems in youth sport across our country. And the Aspen Institute basically put him in charge to go around and get as many different leaders in youth sports from every avenue, from academics to you know, people that are involved day to day, and, and throw them all together on numerous occasions and say, okay, well, not just what are the issues in youth sports, but what are the, what are the solutions? And they have two, two years in a row now, they've had this Project Play Big Summit in Washington, D.C., um, NBC, and you know, all the big media outlets are all there. What's really cool for us is the fact that the last two years, ice hockey has been pointed out as maybe the number one youth sport to get your kids involved in because they're working to try and do the, the very best they possibly can uh, for kids. So we're real proud of that. And over here, you can see our ADM Get logo, but it's a, just a little bit different because the US Olympic Committee has taken out our USA Hockey logo and thrown in the rings. Um, the USOC has adopted the American Development Model for all 42 of its national governing bodies and stuff for it. Now, they are the organization that's in charge of trying to figure out how to make little kids into super elite athletes. And what's really cool about this is 
What's good for the next Mike Madonna in our sport at 8, 9, 10, 11 years of age is the same thing that's good for the average kid that's going to end up you know, playing adult hockey and just having fun. So good stuff. It's no different for either one. But we're being singled out, and you can go online to uh, the United States Olympic Committee's website, look up American Development Model, and some fabulous information comes up. And we're proud that we were sort of the ones getting this going. Some other things that we're doing, uh, looking at body checking, body contact. Uh, USA Hockey now has a facility in Plymouth, Michigan, where our national team program is located, but we own the rink. So we've got some of the very best technology that the National Hockey League uses, and some that the National Hockey League can't use yet. They're not allowed to put wearables on the, the players during competition, uh, during games in the NHL right now. So we're using some of this to track where players are, and then track where all of the contacts are, are located on the rink, and then measure those contacts with a three-dimensional accelerometer. And the technology is, it's called, they're, they're Zephyr, Zephyr sensors. And the military uses them, um, NASA uses them. And what's really cool about these is every time someone gets bumped into on the rink, well, we'll know it, and we'll know exactly what the forces and impacts are. So we're ha not just putting these on the big boys, we're putting them on 14-year-olds, 12-year-olds, 10-year-olds, to look at the sport in a real, realistic way. Because it's 2016, and we have opinions about where, where things happen on the rink, but like Kevin says, do you think or do you know? Well, for the safety and welfare of our kids, we need to know, so that's a big part of what we're doing. Um, here's our country, it's broken up into a lot of different areas, and Scott over here, he's got He's got this area. Um, me, I'm selfish. I just get California. Yeah. Uh, but we've got a big country and not as large a staff as we'd like, but we certainly need to try and get out and cover as much ground as possible. But for us, we just love the fact that the Wildcats are the organization that they are. Um, they call. We're in communication with them regularly. We may not be here as often as we would like, but their coaches are always looking for the you know, the latest information that they want to know, they want to be highly educated, they want to be the best youth development people in sport. Not just ice hockey, but across all sport. And for as long as we've, been, we've known Ben and, and Paul and the rest of the staff now for a few years, and we know how committed